Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. And I um, have included my email here on the slide because we can send out the slides afterwards. And if you have any questions um, about the Asian Islands or anything, feel free to, um, to reach out with any questions, and I'm happy to help. Uh, so I was going to talk briefly, just a really brief introduction to the ACMG guidelines, and then get into um, some of the specifications that different working groups have made to specific criteria, because I think it's sometimes helpful as certain groups or curators are working through the guidelines to know how well other groups are looking at those same criteria codes and thinking of specifying them, um, because a lot of the specifications we've <coughs> looked at so far in the sequence their interpretation work group um, are actually pretty general specifications and not always that disease specific. And so they are applicable to um, multiple other working groups um, who are working through the guidelines. So as you're probably aware, this is the grid from the um, ACMG paper that has, uh, I think it's 28 different criteria. Um, and they're separated out into the different evidence uh, category types here on the left-hand side. Um, and then each criteria is separated out if it is criteria for a benign interpretation versus pathogenic interpretation. Um, and then each criteria is given a code uh, where the first letter of the code um, represents if it's criteria for pathogenic or a benign interpretation. And then the second letter corresponds to the strength. So PS1 strong, PM2, or sorry, PS is pathogenic strong, PM pathogenic moderate. Um, there's not a lot of rhyme or reason to what the numbering is at the end. Um, as you can see, they're not really in any kind of order. Um, so that's, that doesn't carry much, as much weight, but um, well, the important part is knowing what the strength of that evidence is, um, because how you get to a classification at the end is by combining the different strengths of evidence that you have. So as you're probably aware, within ClinGen, we have the different um, ClinGen working groups that are taking the ACMG guidelines and making disease-specific uh, specifications to those guidelines, like what criteria to you or what's your allele frequency threshold? Um, how many segregations do you need to use it at a supporting versus moderate? Um, what is the disease mechanism for the gene that, are, that they're looking at? Um, but then we also have the sequence variant interpretation work group, which is the um, work group that Les B. Seeker and I co-chair. And this group, we are working to sort of harmonize the approaches these different clinical domain working groups are taking. Um, but then also provide some general recommendations of how to use the guidelines in a gene-independent manner um, that uh, we think could be applicable to multiple uh, different groups. Uh, so one thing I was going to clarify just in the beginning, because this will be applicable for some of the um, parts we walk through later, is the even in the guidelines, they call out the fact that while each piece of evidence is given an assigned weight in the grid, you can still change that weight using professional judgment. You know, you might be looking at a functional assay and you don't feel that confident that it's a well-established functional assay, and so you don't want to use it as strong evidence but want to use it as moderate instead. Or maybe you have lots of segregation data and want to move that from supporting up. Um, but in the guidelines, they never provided direction for how to name these criteria when you're changing the uh, strength of the evidence. Um, so within the SEI group, we have recommended that when you are modifying the criteria, that you use the original criteria code followed by an underscore and then the new level of strength. So for example, looking at segregation data, um, it defaults to pathogenic supporting, which is PP1. Um, but then in the grid, it does show with increasing segregation data, you can increase it to moderate or strong. So following our recommendation for naming, if you then are uh, Elevating segregation data to moderate, you would use PP1 underscore moderate. If you're upgrading it to strong, PP1 underscore strong. And then this, so this lets people know, you know, what, what type of evidence this was. Oh, this is segregation data because it's coming from PP1, but now it's used at a strong level. Because we're trying to discourage groups from creating novel criteria codes unless that piece of evidence really doesn't exist anywhere in the grid uh, within the framework. Um, and instead, if they are just modifying the strength of evidence um, to use this um, nomenclature when, um, when you want to change the weight. Um, and then here's kind of an edited grid, oh, it looks like some of the coloring was lost, of um, some of the common criteria that are modified in strength. So again, here is the segregation data, moved up to moderate and strong. Um, de novo data with increasing de novo occurrences is often moved from a moderate piece of evidence to strong. Um, and then the same naming algorithm can be used when you want to decrease the strength. Again, functional assay 
defaults to pathogenic strong, but if you want to move it to a moderate level, that would be PS3 underscore moderate. So with that explanation, uh, I was then going to kind of go through the different evidence category types here on the left um, and talk about different specifications that people have done to each um, uh, type of evidence, or most of them at least, not all. So starting with the top one, population data. Um, so these, I think, are some of the first criteria a lot of groups um, specify because this is, they need to know what their cutoffs are for benign and likely benign so that they can um, filter out variants. So if we start at the ones that would use population databases, BA1, BS1, which are for allele frequency thresholds, and PM2, um, which is if it is absent from any of the population databases. Um, we can kind of discuss how groups have specified um, all three of these criteria. Uh, one thing we've done within this SVI group is propose a rewording to BA1. Uh, so, the, so this is benign standalone, meaning if you have this allele threshold, you can call your variant benign without needing any other data. And the way it's written in the guidelines is allele frequency greater than 5% um, in any of these different uh, population databases. Uh, we've proposed instead to word this as allele frequency greater than 5% in any general continental population data set of at least 2,000 alleles for a gene that doesn't have a gene or variant specific recommendation. So what this means is this first part we added in to show that you don't need to um, use your threshold against the aggregate or the global minor allele frequency. You can compare it to these individual um, subpopulations um, within exact or nomad. So for example, for this variant here, even though the global allele frequency is almost 1%, the fact that it's above 5% in Latinos would let you call this variant benign. Um, also, we think that the tested individual doesn't need to be matched in uh, ethnic origin to the data set used. So even if your case was of European descent, you could still call this variant benign even though it's the 5% was seen in Latinos. And the second clarification that you would use the 5% if there's not a gene or variant uh, specific recommendation was added because we know many groups are going to, provide, are going to um, propose BA1 thresholds that are pretty far below 5% because for many Mendelian disorders, a 5% cutoff is orders of magnitude higher than it needs to be. Um, and we'll talk about how some of the groups are determining what the right threshold would be. Um, but we also have realized that there are some non-benign alleles um, that have a greater than 5% minor little frequency in populations but are not benign, and so we don't want people to accidentally filter these out. Um, and so we've started, oh, it looks like formatting changed here, but we've started gathering a list of what some of these variants are um, to help labs not um, incorrectly filter these variants out as benign based on their frequency when really there is some disease association. All right, so how to actually determine your allele frequency threshold. Um, kind of the equation we've proposed to groups is to use the prevalence times heterogeneity, whether that be genetic heterogeneity or variant, um, divided by the penetrance. And we think when you are gathering these types of data to, you know, your prevalence and penetrance, it's helpful to look for what the most conservative estimates are and the higher estimates are, um, just to kind of get a range, because this will help you figure out how conservative or liberal your approach is to get your allele frequency, um, as well as looking at what the, um, you know, if, uh, if there's one gene that accounts for 90% of the disorder versus there's 12 genes and they all account for a small percent, because um, all these can factor into how you're determining your threshold, um, as well as what the estimates of your penetrance are. And so we're proposing that when you are calculating your benign standalone, the so BA1 threshold, you would use the most conservative estimates from all of these, whereas for BS1, which is uh, just strong criteria and would lead you to uh, likely benign, you can use less conservative estimates. So for example, if, um, you know, for BA1, using this example of a gene here, you would use your most conservative prevalence, which would be 1 in 40,000, um, a uh, genetic heterogeneity of 95%, and your highest penetrance estimate um, to get to an allele uh, frequency cutoff. And I've shown here a screenshot from um, 
can't remember what it's called, but I have a link to this calculator in the, um, I think it's CardioDB, um, in the slides so that I think this is a really helpful calculator to use because you can, you know, play around with if you did a 90% allelic heterogeneity instead of 100% or did 90% penetrance or 70% penetrance, you can see what the outputs would be in each scenario and see how much change you would actually be getting. And then for comparison, for BF1, where you're using less conservative estimates, um, you could use now your lower estimates for um, prevalence, penetrance, and heterogeneity and get to a different um, a lower um, allele frequency cutoff that could be used. Um, so again, here is the link if you want to go to that calculator um, to help determine what the appropriate allele frequency threshold would be for the um, gene that you're looking at. Another thing that's helpful when looking at allele frequencies is using the filtering allele frequency, um, which is a number that is now calculated and present in exact and will soon be out in uh, NOMAD as well. The filtering allele frequency is essentially their correction for what the um, true allele frequency within a subpopulation is. Um, so essentially what they're doing is, so if you look at this variant here, it was found in 23 of over 10,000 Africans, which would lead to an allele frequency of 0.2%. The filtering allele frequency for this variant, looking at that African population, because it's the highest, is closer to 0.15%. Um, and this is because they are taking a 95% confidence interval um, to look at um, sort of the lower rung of that um, confidence interval to determine what maybe the true allele frequency is. So the filtering allele frequency will always be um, lower than what just the calculated allele frequency is. And this is just to make sure that, you know, you aren't incorrectly filtering out variants that um, shouldn't be there by, you know, if for some reason this variant was actually only seen in like one out of 1,000 as opposed to 23 out of 10,000, um, the filtering allele frequency would take that into account um, to help you not inaccurately uh, filter variants out. Is there any questions about this so far? Sorry, feel free to interrupt at any time. Hey, Stephen, could you explain, one, like, say it one more time about the filtering AS? Yes. So the filtering allele frequency, I feel like sometimes it is, people have got a wrong idea of what this is. So it really is just whatever, for any given variant, what subpopulation had the highest minor allele frequency, and then that frequency is corrected for using this 95% Poisson confidence interval. So it's, it'll help you if, like, if you decide your cutoff, let's say for this variant or for your gene, your cutoff was going to be 0.2%, and any variant above 0.2, you were going to call as benign. You would actually want to do your 0.2 comparison against the filtering allele frequency, not just the population with the highest minor allele frequency. Um, just so that you um, can take into account some confidence. So it's not telling you that, you know, for whatever disorder this gene is associated with, anything above 0.1% is, is bad. It's just telling you for this variant, the confidence interval, um, to, or sorry, the allele frequency with some confidence taken into account is actually only 0.1%, not 0.2%. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's better, thank you. Quick question, um, Stephen, for that, with the filtering allele frequency, if somebody were going to be setting a threshold, then I would, um, I, I think empirically what would happen is for a BA setting, um, if, or, and looking at this allele frequency of, of point two in this case, if your allele frequency was lower than that filtering allele frequency, you probably obviously wouldn't be calling it benign. So. Yes, yeah, exactly. You'd be looking to see if but your filter like, frequency right. is above your BA1 threshold. Right, exactly. But that's that's just kind of obvious. Okay, thanks. Yep. And I almost have yes, yeah, they don't, they won't calculate a filtering allele frequency if the count is only one. So that does also help you if in the event that this variant had very low coverage and was only seen in one out of 100 people, even though that would be a 1%, it's not going to give you a filtering allele frequency. Um, because it was only seen one person, so you don't have to worry about accidentally calling that variant benign.
Any other questions about that? And also the building low frequency is available as a download from Exact too, which helps um, if groups want to like look at a gene and in mass call all variants with a certain allele frequency benign um, sort of in one um, catch. So this so is the other allele frequency. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. That was just based on exact data. So you could use your own filtering allele frequency or uh, you could change it based on uh, NOMAD data? Yeah, right. so it could be different in NOMAD because the counts will sort of increase. Um, right. And the filtering frequency I've been told is coming for NOMAD in the somewhat near future, hopefully within the next month or so. Um, okay. But there's, I don't think they have a firm date for when they are going to um, make that available. Okay, yeah. And do you know whether filtering allele frequencies are present, like the data? I uh, where is present? You know, yeah, where it could be downloaded. Right. Yeah, so it's on the website, I think, under downloads. Um, if you go to the VCF folder, uh, there's one in there, I believe, called filtering allele frequency. Um, okay. But I can also send you the link to where it is if you, if you can't find it. But it is okay. under their, um, I mean, they have tons of downloads. And it's, I believe under the VCF folder, there's one called either okay. FAF or filtering allele frequency. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so the other allele frequency rule that involves looking at these databases is that is PM2, um, which is um, absent from controls or at extremely low frequency if recessive. Um, so when determining how you want to use this rule, it's important to know if your gene disease pair is dominant versus recessive. Um, however, we've let groups sort of take a more liberal approach that for the dominant disorders, even though the way it's worded up here makes you think it has to be 100% absent, um, we are allowing for a few counts to occur in there and still have a group call that variant uh, absent or to use this rule. And that's because for some genes, the, you know, the disease associated is a later onset um, or has reduced penetrance. And so it would not be uncommon to see counts in exact that is in align with what the prevalence of that disorder is. So for example, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has a very has reduced penetrance and a later in age onset. Um, so the uh, ClinGen group that was specifying for HCM actually would let the this absent rule get used if the frequency was below 0 0.0004, meaning they'd allow about a max of five alleles to occur within EXAC before um, they would decide that they can't say the variant is absent. Um, again, because about five would be in line with um, what the um, allele frequency of this disorder would be. However, for rathopathy, they took a strict absence because usually there's a much earlier onset of a Noonan or Costello or Leopard syndrome that um, they would not expect to see anybody in exact with um, a pathogenic variant in um, one of those genes. And so even though this was also a dumb disorder, they are saying it has to be strictly absent. So there is some We'll go room here within for dominant disorders as far as if you want to allow it for a few alleles versus follow a, a strict absent um, criteria. Um, and the way a few groups are also trying to decide what their threshold for PM2 would be is to have it be the inverse of BS1, which is the um, benign strong criteria. So, you know, if your BA1 was 0.1%, meaning any allele with frequency greater than 0.1 could be called benign. If your BS1 was maybe a 0.05%, so any variant with frequency above this could be called BS1. You could then have PM2 be anything below 0.05% and have that be the cutoff. Um, but this would only be if you're looking at a recessive or reduced penetrant dominant disorder. Otherwise, if you're looking at a highly penetrant dominant disorder, again, you'd probably want to follow actual strict absence um, uh, criteria for this uh, rule. And then the last one I'm going to look at, oh, sorry, it's two more in here. The BS2 observed in a healthy um, adult individual for a recessive dominant or X-linked disorder with full penetrance expected at an early age. Um, in general, we are suggesting that groups should not use this, ru this rule simply based on occurrences in exact or nomad because you don't know anything about the phenotype. So even if you're seeing it there in five, 10 people, 
um, you don't know anything about their phenotype, so um, it's best to not um, use BS2 because of um, population databases. Um, also, you would not want to use this criteria if your disorder is not fully penetrant, um, has maybe a later in age onset, or even just reduced penetrance, um, then maybe this just criteria in general would not be applicable for the gene that you're looking at. Um, but another way you could specify this rule is by um, saying how many occurrences you would need to see the variant in unaffected people, um, and this is proofy from clinical data, not exact, um, before you would apply this rule. So for example, rathopathy um, decided that they would need to see the variant in at least three well-phenotyped individuals before they would apply uh, BF2, because there is a chance that maybe someone does have just a more mild presentation, um, and so they wouldn't want to call a variant you know, likely benign simply because of one occurrence, but if you see now three people who are very well phenotyped and have no sign of any of the rest of these spectrum disorders, uh, using a BS2 would be applicable. Um, then the last criteria in this set is this prevalence in affected statistically increased over controls. So I took a screenshot from the paper that actually shows some of the notes for uh, this criteria. And then they do say that in the cases where you have a rare variant and you can't do case control studies, um, the fact that you've seen the variant in multiple unrelated patients who all have the same phenotype and it's absent from controls, you could use this criteria as well, but maybe at a, uh, a moderate level. Um, and this criteria has become important for many groups who are specifying the guidelines because, you know, labs and other groups are sending them their case level data and so they're getting this proband count, but there's not a way to really bring it into the guidelines because for many of our clinical cases, we don't have the denominator. So we know we've seen this variant in 20 people who have HCM, but we don't really know out of how many total have ever been tested. Um, so it was hard to get to a, an odds ratio in those cases. And so that's where this uh, sort of caveat comes into place. Um, but we think, so I hear I add this criteria now at the moderate level, but uh, we also feel that with increased proband counts or decreased, you actually could still use this criteria as strong or moderate, depending on the number of probands um, that have this variant that are unrelated um, and having the variant absent from uh, population databases. So in summary, PS3, sorry, yes, PS3, PS4, I can't read, um, could be used, again, if you have an actual case control study that has an odds ratio, or for finding the variant in X number of probands with consistent phenotypes and having the variant meet your absent from uh, databases criteria as well. So Steven, for example, with that, oh, yep. Uh, this is Karen. I just wanted to clarify something. So um, is it problematic at all then to apply PS4 and also, um, if you could go back one, the, the PM2? So I, like no, I, I don't think, yeah, I, so I don't think it is because if you couldn't, so the guidelines had that note that you could use it as moderate evidence if you had multiple cases with the variant and it's absent from controls. But as you can see, absent from databases already is a moderate evidence. So if you didn't allow this to be used with this caveat they have here, in a way you're not giving any weight to the fact you're seeing it in those probands. It still would just come out as moderate whether it was absent and no probands, or absent and in probands. And so that's why we think it does make sense that you can apply PS4 and uh, PM2. Okay, thank you. And then just for comparison, I wanted to show what two of the um, groups who have been specifying the rules for dominant uh, disorders, uh, MY7 and rathopathy, have for their different PS4 thresholds. Um, and you can see they do very, um, quite a bit, but one, they're, the both groups are only letting you use these criteria if you also are meeting PM2, which is the absent. Um, but you can see they, because they are defining PM2 differently, it sort of makes sense why they would allow different amounts here. With Noonan, since they're not really expecting it to be within PM2, they're using lower numbers, whereas for uh, MY7, which would be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there might be a few people in uh, population databases with the variant, and so they're requiring more probands. So odds ratio on these probably come out around the same because of how many controls they could see the variant in, um, but it's just kind of a comparison for um, some of the thresholds that have been proposed. All right, 
going to move on to, is there any questions about population data? Because we're going to move on to um, talking about a few of the computational and predictive data criteria. And I'm not going through every criteria, don't worry. There's not enough time on the call for all of these. Um, I was talking about just a few that have been specified in an interesting way um, by different groups. So one is this BP1, which is benign supporting data for when you are looking at a missense variant in a gene when primarily only truncating variants are known to cause disease. Um, however, we've had groups propose changes to this rule, which makes sense in that BP1 could also be used when you are looking at a loss of function variant and a gene where either the disease is caused by gain of function variant, so again, showing that the variant type you're looking at doesn't actually cause disease, or if it's a loss of function variant where the disease is caused by actually dominant negative LOS variants. Um, and this is because for some where the um, variant occurs in the last exon or so, it doesn't actually lead to um, an absent protein and that this truncated protein um, has a dominant negative effect. Um, so even though the rule is written in a very specific way, we feel that there are um, specifications and changes you can make to this rule to still use uh, BP1 in these other scenarios as well, because it is still sort of the, the same type of data. You're saying that you don't think the type of variant you're looking at actually can cause disease. Um, the two other ones I was going to talk about within this set are the looking at other changes within um, the codon. PS1, which is when you are looking at the, uh, the same amino acid change as a previous, previously established pathogenic variant, um, but with a different cDNA change. So maybe you're looking at the G to C change for valine to leucine, and previously someone, the valine to leucine change by G to T is established as pathogenic. Um, or, and then PM2, which is when you are looking at a um, amino acid change where a different missense change also within that residue has been seen. Um, and for both these, there are caveats to make sure that the, you're looking at whether or not the change is due to an actual splicing change and not because of the amino acid change, and that that's something that should be taken into account so you don't uh, incorrectly call a, another variant within that codon uh, pathogenic when it's not the actual change in amino acid that's, uh, that's bad. So a few general specifications to these rules. Um, one, really for PM5, it doesn't have to be a novel missense change. It could be, you know, a missense change you've looked at multiple times, but now you're reassessing it, and there's a different missense change that's pathogenic um, that's been seen before. Um, so you can, you can ignore that, that novel indicator, and I've, I think, removed it from up here as well. Um, another specification that um, has been used for both PM5 and PS1 is to allow this criteria to be used for analogous genes. And some of the ones that have been proposed so far is looking at the different um, RAS genes, HRAS, NRAS, KRAS, um, MAP2K1 and 2K2, HBA1, HBA2, and these are because there is high homology between these genes. They have um, similar function, and so seeing a change in the same residue but in the different gene is still supportive information. Uh, so for example, say you're looking at glycine to serine in HRAS, and glycine 13 to arginine within KRAS is established as pathogenic, you could then use PM5 in this instance, even though it is a different gene, um, because it is still within the same um, uh, important residue. However, it's important to define what the mapping between these anal analogous genes are. For example, is glycine 13 in, a RAS, in HRAS actually um, the equivalent also glycine 13 within KRAS, or you know, was one gene off by two amino acids or five amino acids or something like that. So kind of knowing exactly where the mappings are between the analogous regions uh, is important. And another general modification for PM5, which is again, if you're looking at a different, uh, different pathogenic missense chain has been seen before, is to allow this criteria to be upgraded to strong, so PM5 strong, if there are two or more different pathogenic missense changes in that residue seen before, um, because that is even more suggestive that um, that residue, that changes at that residue are not tolerated. Um, so in those instances, you could use um, this now as a strong level. And then another specification for PS1, which is the same amino acid change 
is um, being able to use this criteria for splice site variants. We have an example here that um, we worked through with the P10 group is um, to allow this criteria again to be used if there's a different uh, splice change seen that is known to be pathogenic. So say you're assessing a plus 5G to T and plus 5G to A is an established pathogenic variant that has been shown to impact splicing and a functional assay. So if you're assessing G to T and there, there's no functional information but the in silico predictions show that the impact of the G to T is, equal, is either equally or more damaging than the established G to A change, you could use PS1 in this instance. However, if, again, the same scenario, again, with the, a, the G to A change being pathogenic, if the variant you're assessing, the G to T, is not predicted to be as damaging and may be predicted to have no impact, um, then you would not um, use PS1. Um, and in these instances, because you're taking in silico predictors into account, if you're using PS1 for these scenarios, you wouldn't also want to use PP3, which is for splicing predictions, because that would be double counting the, um, you know, a certain type of evidence. Does that make sense? Any questions about that idea? Um, oh, one more uh, modification within this computational predictive data field is um, looking at PBS1, which is if you're looking at a predicted null variant where loss of function is a known mechanism of disease for that gene, uh, gene and disease. So we've allowed PBS1 to actually be downgraded to moderate, so PBS1 moderate, um, in instances where maybe loss of function is the, the gene disease association is definitive, but there's only a moderate amount of evidence that loss of function variants actually contribute to disease. So that'd be a case where you wouldn't want to use it at the very strong level and moving it down to moderate would make sense. Or maybe the gene disease association itself is only has, there's only a moderate level of evidence that that gene contributes to disease, but all of the evidence is supportive that it's loss of function variants that cause that disease. Um, that would be another instance of where um, PDS1 moderate would be um, applicable. All right, um, so skipping down to de novo data. Um, these are PS2, which is de novo when you have confirmed paternity and maternity, and PM6, which is de novo, um, but you haven't um, confirmed uh, paternity or maternity. So an important caveat with using either of these two criteria um, is that the phenotype should actually match what the gene disease association is. Um, so this is, I took just a screenshot from the ACMG paper um, that spells this out. So you wouldn't want to use this um, criteria for a de novo variant in a patient who has a phenotype that is not associated with that gene at all. Um, so for example, um, an example that someone had sent to us was that they found a de novo missense variant in um, uh, MEPP2. But the patient was only presenting with intellectual disability and they didn't have any phenotype of what you would see within Rett syndrome at all, that using this de novo occurrence as strong criteria or even moderate criteria is allowing too much weight. Um, so it's not just the de novo occurrence, but you also need to think about is the phenotype actually indicative of what you would expect for a variant within that gene. Um, and additionally, we have also has a, have allowed both these criteria to be increased in strength with increasing independent de novo occurrences. Um, so allowing, oh, I forgot to add the very strong here, but PS2 could be used at a very strong level if you have two independent de novo occurrences where paternity and maternity have been confirmed. Uh, and for PM6, if you had two occurrences of de novo without confirming paternity or maternity, you could move that up to a strong uh, criteria. All right, uh, so the next type uh, I was going to look at was the allelic data. Um, uh, more important, or more specifically looking at this moderate PM3, uh, which is for recessive disorders detected in trans with a pathogenic variant. Um, and the paper does say for NOPE that you actually need to determine phase to make sure that other variant you're looking at is in trans and that these two variants aren't in this. Um, but a specification that we've been working on for this rule is to allow the weight to be changed according to variant 
strength and number of occurrences. So what we mean by that is um, that in PM3 could move down to a supporting level when in sort of two different instances, if the variant on the other allele is uh, suspicious, so maybe it doesn't quite meet your criteria for pathogenic or likely pathogenic, um, but it's suspicious and, and maybe absent from controlled databases, um, using that occurrence at a supporting level instead um, would make sense. Or say your proban is homozygous for this variant and this variant is absent from controlled databases, so it is a very rare variant. The fact that you're seeing someone that's homozygous for this variant and I should note that, of course, this condition is recessive, um, could also be used at a supporting level um, in this case. Or you could use PM3 upgraded to strong in instances where you are seeing multiple unrelated probands who are compound HET that have a different pathogenic variant in trans. So, for example, say you are assessing this histidine frame shift variant. You've seen it in three probands, and you can see that there, so two of them have the same other pathogenic variant in trans. One has a different pathogenic variant in trans. This would be a case where you could use PM3 upgraded to strong because it's showing that um, this variant is seen in multiple cases who have another pathogenic variant, and it's not even always the same pathogenic variant in trans, um, just to give additional weight to the fact that, um, that this is uh, seen in so many cases. Steven. Yep. So for the homozygous rule, remind me, you have to rule out a deletion, right, to use? Oh, so that is a, a, a good point. But yeah, to make sure that they are actually homozygous and it's not because of a allele dropout or because you're not seeing other allele. Um, so yeah, and make sure it's actually is homozygous. And then can you use it in cases of consanguinity? So that's a good point. And I, I didn't address that here because we've been wondering that even for segregation. I mean, if you're looking at a consanguinous family that has, you know, three segregations of, you know, three children that are all affected and they're all homozygous, does that really carry the same weight as three independent segregations and non-consanguinous families? And we haven't come up with firm guidelines at this point for when that's applicable. Um, I feel like with consanguinity, I would always maybe err on the more conservative side and use it at the lowest possible weight. Um, but we, we are meeting later this summer the sequence variant interpretation work group to provide clearer thresholds for segregation counts. Um, and mm -hmm. I think take, looking at what we should decide to do when there is consanguinity would be important, as well as um, actually looking at this rule as well to see if that would be um, something that could impact when you could use this rule. Okay. So yeah, Thanks. that's a good point. Uh, any other questions about this suggestion? The last section I was going to talk about is this other databases. So a reputable source saying pathogenic, which is uh, data at a pathogenic supporting level, reputable source saying benign at a benign supporting level. We really disagree with these criteria and think they should, as a default, just not ever be used um, unless someone has it proposes a really great database that they think is um, could be used for these because um, by using these in a way you are double counting evidence. If you're looking at a group that said pathogenic and that's based on, you know, three different papers that have had segregation data, if you're assessing that variant, you're also taking into account those, those publications. So in a way you're double counting that data by saying, oh, someone else has called it pathogenic and now we're looking at it too, um, it could lead just to overcalling um, so our suggestion is to just not use either of these criteria um, in your assessments um, and to instead, if you do see someone who has a interpretation of pathogenic or benign, to reach out to those um, labs or groups and to um, ask if they, what, event, what evidence they had um, and make sure that you are incorporating the same evidence into uh, your interpretation. Last thing I was going to mention is our work group is also um, planning on moving or proposing a move um, to more of a phase approach to the classification. So right now when you are classifying a variant, it's based on counting up how many pieces of evidence you have at different strengths. And so um, all these are based on just, you know, yes, no, met, not met, and then using these different, um, you know, however many you have of moderate and supporting and strong to reach your classification. But we'd like to move this to more of a quantitative approach. 
um, which would let you then have a better refinement of how much weight you can give to each type of evidence um, and really see how much impact that has on your overall classification. Um, but moving to this approach would also allow us to make better definitions for when um, a variant should be called uh, uncertain significance when you have data on the pathogenic side and benign side. Um, so in the guidelines, they say uncertain significance if um, criteria are not met or criteria for benign and pathogenic um, are not in agreement. But they aren't really saying here, you know, if you reach a pathogenic interpretation and you just have a piece of evidence on the benign side, is that uncertain or is it saying if you have some criteria on both sides? And so I think, I don't know if they were vague on purpose, but um, it's not incredibly clear here from um, the way it's worded of which scenario is applicable. So by moving to a quantitative approach, though, we've been able to sort of map out different scenarios and see what the classifications would be. Um, so for example, looking at a very strong with two moderates, which would get you to a pathogenic interpretation, if you have this combination plus just a benign supporting piece of data, then actually the posterior, the posterior probability score comes out still in the pathogenic range, meaning if you have path, if you're reaching a pathogenic interpretation, all, and if all you have on the benign side is supporting data, that that's not enough to overrule your, uh, your classification. However, we saw in another scenario, if we were looking at two pathogenic strongs, which would also meet criteria for uh, pathogenic, but then you have a benign strong piece of evidence, that actually this does give you a score more in the VUS range. Um, so we were trying to work through sort of all the different scenarios to come out with better guidelines of how to weight the benign and pathogenic evidence um, to determine when that really should be a VUS versus um, being able to confidently call a variant pathogenic or benign. Um, and we have a paper we just submitted to um, Genetics and Medicine to uh, work through some of these scenarios. So hopefully we'll have some um, firm guidance on um, these in the near future. I think that's all I had. Um, but again, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any thoughts, ideas, issues, anything, um, and discuss further. Hey, Stephen, I've got a question. This is um, Jessica Muster with the P10 group. Um, so I noticed that one, hey, I noticed that one area that you didn't touch on, upon today was um, PP4, so phenotype yeah. data. Yeah. Um, I know that our, our group is, is struggling with how to harmonize utilizing PP4 along with the idea to do kind of proband counting with PS4. Um, is, that, is that something that you guys are still discussing? Yeah, and it, it's, it is still, yeah, sort of a, a great area to decide of, you know, so the, the criteria Jessica was talking about here is this PP4, if your patient's phenotype or family history is highly specific for that gene. Um, that maybe if you met this criteria but you had multiple probands that, you know, all met this criteria, would you want to elevate this to a moderate or strong, um, whereas we've been advising groups instead to use this PS4 for probands, and it, yeah, we haven't quite decided what the right approach is, because so far of the groups we've looked at, they have not been using PP4, um, they've either decided it is not applicable for their gene or not using it in that manner, so um, it is something that the FDI group still has to um, figure out the right approach so we can give you guidance on, um, on how to count those. Yeah, I, I mean, I can see it being a, a totally different question for a disease like cardiomyopathy, which has, you know, it's really heterogeneous, um, you know, or, or not due to anything identifiable via genetic testing. But I'm wondering, so I may, I'm wondering if, you know, the PS4 approach is better for diseases like that, and PP4, modifying PP4 is better for, you know, rare diseases that really have only one genetic etiology. So, so you can say that the phenotype is super specific to the gene. Yeah, I agree, and I think that makes sense. And we would want then, you know, for if a group uses PS4, then they shouldn't use PP4, and if a group uses PP4, then shouldn't mm -hmm. use PS4. Right. And I think that idea would make sense. Um, right. So yeah, I need to bring that to um, less of the group and see what they think, because um, especially like, I think for the P10 group, you guys had such a firm definition of how you were using PP4, whereas I think other mm -hmm. ones it's been a little more vague. So it it does match with, um, I think, the way that you'd want to use it um, correctly. 
Yeah, I've got yeah, more I'm questions, so I'll ultimately let somebody else have a turn too. Sounds like it's just you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, so another another area that um, I also know that we didn't talk about was the found in an, with an alternate cause, so the BP5 criteria. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So with, with that one, I know that um, our group has kind of taken the approach of being really, really strict with it and not considering an alternate cause as counting if it overlaps at all with the phenotype. So, you know, for example, P10 causes increased risk for, for breast cancer. So if, you know, we find this P10 variant in, in somebody who has breast cancer, but they also have a BRCA2 pathogenic variant, because the phenotypes overlap, that you know they, they both might be contributing somehow to phenotype. Um, we're, we're to be conservative, where we would not count that as a co-occurrence. Um, do y'all think that philosophy makes sense, or would you uh, uh, maybe recommend that groups up approach it in a more broad sense? The other thing that that does make sense. Um, I, two of the groups, or at least I think cardiomyopathy maybe decided this one wasn't applicable just because. There are so many genes associated with cardiomyopathy, and sometimes having variants in two genes increases your risk, mm -hmm. and maybe at least like an earlier onset. So um, I do think erring, erring more on the conservative side makes sense in the way that you were, that would be a little more conservative, that just because you've seen this variant in someone who also had another pathogenic variant in another gene would not mean that, you know, that, is, it, that wouldn't necessarily be uh, benign evidence um, for the pathogenicity of the variant. But I'm wondering, like, also if you have maybe multiple occurrences of that, would you maybe then want to use it at that supporting level? But having just one mm -hmm. occurrence would not be enough to um, apply this rule. Thanks. And just the, the last one that I think, um, you know, gave, gave a lot of the groups some headaches was um, back to population data. So one challenge that we have is that you know, there's some really old literature about the prevalence of, of you know, of Cowden syndrome associated with P10 mutations, but we, but you know, kind of in the 20 years since, there's been a lot more information about a broadened phenotype. So the disorder is probably a lot more common than was originally published, and we kind of struggle with what's our starting point for for prevalence. Um, I think we would struggle finding something, you know, that would be published and reliable. For, for prevalence, um, and, and ditto for penetrance, because the phenotypes are so, so diverse, um, and, and different people can, can have completely different aspects of the disorder. We, we really struggled with using the, the type of calculator that, um, that was presented over there, so instead we went kind of a really, really, um, oh gosh, probably extremely conservative approach um, with, with setting our allele frequencies. Um, so I guess what, what advice would you have for groups that are really having troubles identifying numbers to plug into the calculator to try to, I guess, rationalize their decisions? Yeah, so I think um, one of the nice things about the calculator is it, you know, has that scale so you can sort of see the different impact you have. Like mm -hmm. if you said, let's start it with one in, one th one in 100,000 versus one in 300,000, how different does it come out? But I think also yeah. being able to have a list of variants that you know are confidently benign and confidently pathogenic that have, you know, illegal frequency data to sort of use those as a check to see, okay, am I still able to call all of these benign with the disorder and there's no pathogenic ones slipping in here or, um, you know, for ones where there's, you know, somewhere in between, how do those ones come out with each um, type? That I think some uh, testing with different variants uh, is helpful. But at the end of the day, also, if, it's, if there isn't a published prevalence or penetrance, I think we'd also be comfortable with a work group coming out with their own of saying, you know, even though there's not anything published that's within this range, based on the experts that we have in this disease area as part of this work group, you know, we think that the prevalence is, you know, closer to this estimate mm -hmm. and uh, providing an estimate for what uh, you think it could be. Okay. Okay, that would work for us, I think. Thanks. That's sure. it. That's it. Everybody else can can have at it. Can you, can you show that website um, to calculate um, the allele frequencies again? Yeah, this one. Yeah. Thank you. 
And I can send out the slides as well. Um, oh, please. This was very helpful. Thank you so much. And I, and there's, and I forgot to actually mention this. Um, I'll send out the paper that this calculator came from. I forgot to actually put the reference for it, but it was from um, Nikki Whitman and James Ware, who were also very involved with the um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy group. That um, they, the paper provides a good explanation as well as the filtering a little frequency um, uh, approach because the filtering a little frequency also sort of came out of this same paper that the calculator did. It was this is the 